All right. Are there any questions? All right. No, no questions? Okay. Then I'll continue. Right. So today we are going to cover cell division, right, and uh, even also the control of cell division. So in this chapter, we are going to discuss cell division, which plays a crucial role in the propagation of all life. Right? The only way to make more cells is by division of those that already exist. Right? So there used to be a, a theory called the spontaneous generation theory right? in the 1800s right? that about life arising spontaneously. But that was put to rest by Louis Pasteur right? when he showed that, you know, that life can only originate from you know, some other life. Okay, so new cells can be produced only from living cells. Right? So that was put to rest in, in the 19th century. So a cell reproduces by carrying out a tightly controlled sequence of events in which it duplicates its contents and divides in two. This cycle of duplication and division, which is known as the cell cycle, is the essential mechanism by which all living things reproduce. Right? In the case of unicellular, that is single-celled organisms, such as bacteria or yeast, each cell division is going to lead to a complete new organism. Right? While in the case of multicellular organisms such as ourselves, many rounds of cell division are required to make a new individual from the single cell egg. Right? Like uh, a human has about 100 trillion cells, so you can imagine how many rounds of cell division are needed. Right? Uh, in multicellular organisms, quite of often cell division has to be carried out to sustain the organism even in the steady state. Right? Like the cell on your skin, they are replaced once every 10 days. Right? In your gut, once every three days. So even in the steady state, when you're not growing, right, you need cell division to be happening all the time. Right? Now the details of the cell cycle vary from one organism to another and at different stages in an organism's life. Right? Because if it's a little child that is developing in the womb, right, fetus developing in the womb, Cell division, the rate of cell division will be very high, right? If it's a if it's a fully grown adult, where is that sound coming from? The light? Speaker. Which speaker is it? How where? No That's not from my thing, right? I mean it has something to, again the volume has gone down looks like, right? Where? No, that will bring the screen down. And there should be something related to sound. Anyway, I'm going to shout out so that... <laughs> and you, you, you guys are going to reject the disturbances, okay? Because if you take the course, you know, controls class with me, we do disturbance rejection, right? So you're going to have to give robust performance in the presence of disturbances. So the disturbance is gone. See, it got scared, right? Uh, so if, if it's like a child that is developing in the womb, cell division, cell division is going to be accelerated. Okay? But if it's a fully grown, mature adult, you don't need that much of cell division. Right. So despite these differences that the rates of cell division vary, right, there are certain characteristics which are universal about cell division. For example, the cell that is undergoing division must replicate its DNA, right? Because both the daughter cells have to have exactly the same DNA, right? And it must pass on identical copies of the DNA, the cell that is dividing to its two daughter cells, right? Now, if you're looking at prokaryotes or bacteria, right? So pro prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, all right? Again, I'm just reminding you about that. So prokaryotes or bacteria, they don't have a nucleus, and they reproduce by a fission type of cell division. So the cell division is pretty simple, right? Here, what's going to happen is that the circular bacterial chromosome is going to be replicated, right? Probably by rolling circle replication, which I covered, right, when I talk about the fertility plasmid. And one copy is going to move towards each end of the dividing bacterium, right? And the cell wall and the plasma membrane, right, in the center of the dividing bacterium will pinch inwards, right? And that's how you will get two bacteria, right, from one single bacterium, right? Now, if you look at a eukaryotic organism, right? Cell division is a lot more complex, right? That's because most of the genetic information of the cell, namely its nuclear genome, is distributed between multiple chromosomes contained in the nucleus, right? Now, if you're looking at a eukaryotic cell, there is some 
DNA also in the mitochondria and the chloroplast and so on, okay? But most of the DNA is concentrated in the nucleus. So for eukaryotic cells, besides nu nuclear division, the cytoplasm also contains many organelles which must be duplicated. Like you have the mitochondria, you have the chloroplast, you have peroxisomes and so on. Okay, there are lots of different organelles, right? That have to be duplicated and properly partitioned between the two daughter cells at cell division. So, so that's why eukaryotic cell division is a lot more complex. Now, there are three major questions that come up in the context of cell division. First one is the mechanisms by which cells duplicate their contents, right? Number two, number two, the mechanisms by which cells partition their duplicated contents and then split into two, right? And the third one is the mechanisms employed by the cells to ensure that the different steps involved in cell division take place in the proper sequence, right? Because you, there has to be some kind of timing, right? So what is the timing mechanism? Just like in a computer, you have a clock that is doing the timing, right? So in cell division also, you need some kind of timing mechanism. Now, partial answers to the first question have already been provided because we've, uh, you know, talked about protein synthesis. So how, how you know, prote protein can be duplicated, all right? Then we have talked about DNA replication, right? So we have already answered those questions, all right? In this chapter, we are going to focus on the second question, right? Which is, what are the mechanisms by which the cells partition their duplicated contents and split into two, right? And the answer to the third question, that is, how, how are the events associated with cell division appropriately timed, right? So that everything happens pretty smoothly. That question is going to be answered in the next chapter. All right, any questions? Now, the duration of the cell cycle, right? The cell cycle means grow, divide, grow, divide, right? That's the cell cycle. So the duration of the cell cycle varies greatly from one cell type to another. For example, a single cell yeast can divide every 90 to 120 minutes right? in ideal conditions, while a mammalian liver cell divides on average less than once a year. Okay. So in this chapter, we are going to focus on the sequence of events in a fairly rapidly dividing mammalian cell with a cell cycle of about 24 hours. So a cell that divides once a day. Okay. Now, if you're looking at the eukaryotic cell cycle, that is broadly divided into two phases, right? And we already encountered these phases before. We had M phase, that's when the nuclear division happens, right? And then in between two M phases, you have interphase, right? So M phase, which is composed of mitosis or nuclear division, and cytokinesis, that is the actual splitting of the cell in two, right? And then interphase, which is the period between one M phase and the next, right? And the interphase is further divided into three additional phases of the cell cycle, as shown in the figure on the next slide, right? So here, this is the cell cycle, right? It's going in the clockwise direction. This is the M phase, okay, which is made up of mitosis and cytokinesis, right? And then in between each M phase and the next one, you have interface. So all of this stuff in green and even this thing in the, in the middle, that's all interface, right? Now interface, you can divide it into three different phases. One of them is what is called the S phase. S is for abbreviation for synthesis, right? S phase, because that's when the DNA is synthesized or the replication of the DNA occurs, right? Now between M phase and S phase, right, you have what is called the G1 phase. G is for gap, right? Abbreviation for gap. Gap number one phase, so that's from this M phase to the S phase, and this is when the cell grows, right? And so there's an increase in the cell size, right? Then even after the S phase, there's another gap two, or G2 phase, when there is growth and there is preparation for mitosis, right? Now you need these two guys, because if you just have mitosis, if you just divide the cell, replicate the DNA, divide the cell, then with every progressive cell division, the cell is going to get smaller and smaller. Right, because you have not duplicated the other things. You have not given the cell enough time to grow, right? And cell divisions of that type, they are called cleavage cell divisions. They do take place. When there is a fertilized egg, the first few cell divisions of its life are cleavage cell divisions, right? Only DNA replication, then cell division. DNA replication, mitosis. DNA replication, mitosis, right? But this cannot continue indefinitely because, you know, then the cell gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So you are going to have these G1, gap one, and G2, gap two phases to ensure that the cell gets enough time to uh, grow in size. So all this stuff is 
spelled out here. Right? So during S phase, S is synthesis, DNA replication takes place. Right? Then the S phase is flanked by two phases where the cell continues to grow. Right? I talked about the G1 phase and the G2 phase. So the G1 phase, again, G, and I'm repeating myself, you know, because that's the power of reinforcement learning, right? Because these are things that you will have to kind of learn and, and memorize. Why? Because when the biologist talks to you, they will talk about S phase, okay? They will say something got arrested in G1. They'll talk about G1 arrest, okay? At that time, if you, th if you think about somebody getting arrested in and sent to the Brian jail, right? It's not going to work, right? You need to be familiar with this terminology, right? So the G1 phase is the interval between the completion of the M phase and the beginning of the S phase. The G2 phase is the interval between the end of the S phase and the beginning of the M phase. That's what I showed you on the diagram, right? Now, there are particular times in the G1 and G2 phases when the cell has to make a decision about whether to proceed to the next phase or to pause to allow more time to prepare. And these times are called the G1 and G2 checkpoints. There are checkpoints. Has the cell grown large enough? Has everything been uh, duplicated, right? So should I go and replicate the DNA, right? So those are questions that the cell is going to ask itself before moving to the next phase, right? Now, during all of interphase, a cell continues to transcribe genes. Again, what is transcript? What does it mean to transcribe genes? Yeah, DNA to RNA, right? It'll synthesize proteins, right? And it'll also grow in mass, right? So together, G1 and G2 phases, provide additional time for the cell to grow and duplicate all its cytoplasmic organelles, right? That means all those different compartments that it has in the cytoplasm. So without the G1 and G2 phases, as I mentioned, the cell would get progressively smaller at each cell division. And this is in fact what happens to a fertilized egg during the first few cell divisions of its life. And those are referred to as cleavage cell divisions, right? Just splitting, cleavage cell divisions, sorry. Now, the first readily visible sign under a microscope that a cell is about to enter M phase is the progressive condensation of its chromosomes, right? That's how actually chromosomes were identified, right? In, in the 1800s, right? Using a microscope, they were, when the cell was about to divide, they could see the, uh, the chromosomes, right? Because they had condensed, right? So this con condensation makes the chromosomes less likely to get entangled and therefore physically easier to separate during mitosis, right? And the separation of the duplicated condensed chromosomes is carried out by a transient structure. That structure is not there all the time. It assembles on an as-needed basis. All right? So this transient structure is called the mitotic spindle. All right? For animal cells, the actual division of the cell is carried out by what is called a contractile ring, which is made up of two kinds of protein filaments, actin and myosin. So like the mitotic spindle, the contractile ring is also a transient structure. It's only produced whenever it's needed, right? It's not there all the time. Now, in the case of plant cells, and that is important because in this class, you know, the focus is going to be on plant genomics, okay? Once we finish covering all these basics. So in the case of plant cells, the cytoplasmic division has to be carried out by a little bit different mechanism because each cell, right, in the case of a plant, is enclosed within a hard cell wall. Now, when the cell divides, even the small organelles have to be duplicated right, and partitioned properly. So these organelles, such as mitochondria and chloroplasts, are usually present in large numbers in each cell and will be safely inherited by the daughter cells if, on the average, their numbers simply double once every cell cycle. Right? So if the numbers double every time the cell divides, and they're present in large numbers, so more or less they'll be equally divided. Right? Now, other larger organelles, such as the Golgi apparatus, and the endoplasmic reticulum, right? So Golgi apparatus is, is the place where the cell synthesizes a lot of its components, okay? Endoplasmic reticulum is where these synthesized components are modified, right? So these things are much larger organelles, right? So, you know, you cannot just hope to just duplicate it and assume that everything is going to be okay. So these things usually disintegrate, they're dismantled, all right, into smaller fragments during mitosis which will increase the chances that the latter will be more or less evenly distributed among the daughter cells when the cell divides. These components will be evenly distributed. And subsequently, the organelles are reconstructed from the inherited fragments present in each daughter cell. Right. So we are next going to take a detailed look at mitosis, right, which is the type of nuclear division that most eukaryotic cells undergo. Right. So this is the kind of 
cell division that all somatic cells, that means all cells in the body undergo, right? The cells that give rise to the egg and sperm, they undergo a different kind of cell division, which is called meiosis, which I will talk about towards the end of this chapter. So now we are going to talk about mitosis and cytokinesis. Now before mitosis begins, so mitosis is a nuclear division. Each chromosome has been replicated and consists of two identical. So chromosome has been replicated, how? By DNA replication. Okay, we talked about DNA polymerase and then, you know, it's in a condensed state also. Right? Has been replicated and consists of two identical chromatids called sister chromatids, which are jo joined together along their length by interaction between proteins on the surface of the two chr uh, chromatids. A typical pair of sister chromatids is shown in the figure, right? This is the figure, right? So you see these are two replicated uh, chromosomes, right? That are attached along the length, and these are the, uh, so the, this is one chromatid, this is a, the other chromatid, and the two to, together, they're called sister chromatids, right? And uh, uh, when the two replicated chromosomes have to be separated, that is going to be carried out by something that is called the mitotic spindle, I'll talk about later, okay? And the mitotic spindle attaches to each chromatid via a protein that is called a kinetochore, right? So at the appropriate time, the kinetochore will come. And how is the kinetochore go going to know where to bind? Because there is a special sequence which is called the centromere. Okay, we talked about the centromere. That's where the kinetochore will bind. And that's where the kinetochore mic uh, microtubule, that part of the mitotic spindle will come and attach, right? We will discuss this a little bit later, right? This is just like a preview. Because in this picture, you can see all these things coming up. Now, although mitosis proceeds as a continuous sequence of events, it is usually divided into five stages for you know, explanation purposes. The first one is called prophase. Right? Pro means before. Okay, so prophase. The next one is called prometaphase. Right? That means it's before metaphase. Right? Then you have metaphase. Then you have what is called anaphase. And then the last phase is telophase. Right? So there are five different stages that are involved in mitosis. And we will discuss each one of them in detail. Any questions? So during, so first there'll be a brief discussion of each phase and then the detailed discussion, right? So during prophase, what happens is that the replicated chromosomes, they condense, right? Because before the replicated chromosomes are going to be separated, they need to condense because it's going to, it's going to be much easier to separate them in the condensed state, right? So the replicated chromosomes condense and the mitotic spindle begins to assemble outside the nucleus, right? And I have to explain to you what the mitotic spindle is. So during prometaphase, that's the next stage in mitosis, the nuclear envelope breaks down, right? The nuclear envelope disintegrates, allowing the spindle microtubules to contact the chromosomes and bind to them. And I will explain to you what those spindle microtubules are in a few minutes, right? During the next stage, which is called metaphase, the mitotic spindle will gather all of the chromosomes to the center equator of the spindle. During anaphase, which is the, ne the next phase, the two sister chromatids in each replicated chromosome, synchronously they'll split apart, and the spindle draws them to the opposite poles of the cells. Again, there's a lot of explanation needed because there's terminology that has been introduced. I will explain on the, on the next few slides. All right. And then the next stage is called telophase during which a nuclear envelope reassembles around each of the two sets of separated chromosomes to form two nuclei, right? So in three of the stages d described above, we have ref referred to the, what is called the mitotic spindle, right? So the next question that naturally comes up is, how is the mitotic spindle formed and what exactly is its role? Right? So we have talked about all these different phases. The pro first phase is prophase, okay? The mitotic spindle starts to assemble in prophase, right? That's even, that's even when the nuclear envelope is intact, the mitotic spindle starts assembling. So towards the end of the S phase, right? Again, what was the S phase? The S phase is the synthesis phase of the DNA replication phase, right? So towards the end of the S phase, the cell actually duplicates a structure, which is called the centrosome, to produce two daughter centrosomes, right? which initially remain together at one side of the nucleus, right? As prophase begins, right? That means when mitosis is started, this is just the beginning of mitosis. As prophase begins, these two daughter centrosomes, they'll separate and move to the opposite poles of the cell, right? Driven by, how do they move? 
Again, they are driven by centrosome-associated motor proteins. Okay, remember I showed you in the chapter on proteins, we discussed how proteins can walk. Okay, they can use the energy of ATP hydrolysis to move around, right? Then inside the cell, there is something that is called a cytoskeleton, right? Where, you know, there are, it's like a highway that is laid out on an as-needed basis, right? So the, this uh, centrosome can move along that highway that has been laid out, right? And move to either side of the, of the, of the dividing cell, right? So as prophase begins, the two daughter centrosomes separate and move to the opposite poles of the cell, driven by centrosome-associated motor proteins. But you need energy for movement. Where is that energy going to come from? ATP, right? We talked about that ATP, ATP cycle and all that stuff, right? The high-energy phosphoanide bonds are going to be used to power this movement. Right. So, so these motor proteins use the energy of ATP hydrolysis to move along the microtubules, right? Now, each centrosome then serves to organize its own array of microtubules, and the two sets of microtubules then interact to form what is called the mitotic spindle. The figure on the next page will make everything clear. Right? So it'll, sh it'll show the two centrosomes with their own array of microtubules. Right? So here, so this is one centrosome, this is another centrosome. Right? So in, during S phase, all right, the centrosomes have been replicated. Uh, replica the single centrosome has been replicated. And then in prophase, you have the two centrosomes are moving towards the two sides of the dividing cell. Right? Now, each centrosome is going to produce its own array of microtubules. Okay, how is that produced? There is a, a protein called tubulin, right? and units of that are added together right? to produce a microtubule. Right? And there is continuous polymerization and depolymerization. It's like if you're trying to go from here to Houston, all right? The highway, let's say, is not laid in concrete, right? It's being laid out, right? Then it's take, being taken back. If somebody needs to go, then somehow maybe stuff is being laid out, let's say, from College Station and from uh, Houston, right? Somewhere in the middle, they'll meet to facilitate the transition. And then again, it'll be dismantled, right? So this is being laid out. It's, it's growing, shrinking, growing, shrinking, right? Now, what might happen is that... so. So like two of these microtubules, all right, they might just meet, okay, one originating from here, one originating from the, uh, from the other centrosome. They might meet and, you know, they, once they meet, then it is kind of temporarily protected from disassembly, right, and it produces what is called a polar microtubule. Why? Because each of these centrosomes, all right, so this is like the North Pole and the South Pole, right, so these are called the two poles, the equator is in between, right, we'll use this terminology later on, right. So they come and, come and meet here. So these are called polar microtubules because they are linking together the two poles, right? Then there'll be some microtubules that, you know, basically grow and shrink but don't get attached to anything. Those are called the unattached microtubules, right? And then once the nuclear envelope disintegrates, right? See, these, micro, uh, these microtubules are growing, shrinking, growing, shrinking. Once the nuclear envelope disintegrates, right? These guys will have access to the kinetochore protein, right? And they will bind. So, so one microtubule from here will come and bind the kinetochore on the left side. This one will bind the kinetochore on the right side. And these microtubules that have bound the kinetochore, right? These are called kinetochore microtubules, right? And these are the guys, okay? These, and then these, these are the ones that will bring about the separation later on. Okay, because once the connections between these two sister chromatids is cut, right, by some enzymes, then, you know, these, these microtubules are going to pull the two chromosomes, the two uh, replicated chromosomes to two ends of the dividing cell. Right. So that's what's going to happen. So I think a picture is worth not a thousand, maybe 10,000 words, because we are going to now just go through the text and everything will make sense. All right. All right. So this is basically textual description of whatever I already discussed using the picture. So the microtubules that radiate from the centrosome in an interface cell continuously polymerize and depolymerize, right? Grow and shrink by the addition and loss of units of a protein that, are, that is called tubulin, right? Individual microtubules therefore alternate between growing and shrinking, and this is process is called dynamic instability, right? So if you go in there, okay? If you go in there, you put in some chemical in the cell, that is either going to stop the growth or the shrinkage, then you're going to mess up the procedure, right? Keep that in mind. Right. So the rapidly growing and shrinking microtubules extend in all directions from the centrosomes, exploring the interior of the cell, right? During prophase, while the nuclear envelope is still intact, that hasn't disintegrated, 
Some of these microtubules become stabilized against disassembly to form the highly organized mitotic spindle, right? Like I showed you in the picture, right? See, the nuclear envelope is still intact, so this, this portion cannot go and touch the kinetochores, but this one can, okay? So it can form these polar microtubules, okay? That's part of the mitotic spindle. So this happens when some of the microtubules growing from opposite centrosomes interact, binding the two sets of microtubules together to form the basic framework of the mitotic spindle. The interacting microtubules are called polar microtubules. That's what I showed you in the picture, since they originate from the two poles of the spindle. And the two centrosomes that give rise to them are called the spindle poles. Okay. So you now have two poles here, so you'll have an equator in the middle. So this is during prophase, okay, all that stuff is happening. The next one is prometaphase, right? So during prometaphase, the nuclear envelope is going to disintegrate, right? So chromosomes get attached to the mitotic spindle during prometaphase, right? So prometaphase starts abruptly with the disintegration of the nuclear envelope, right? And following this, the spindle microtubules, which have been lying in wait outside the nucleus, they've been growing, shrinking, growing, shrinking, right? Suddenly they gain access to the replicated chromosomes and they will bind to them through the kinetochore protein, right? So the spindle microtubules bind the chromosomes through specialized protein complexes called kinetochores, which are formed on the chromosomes during late prophase, right? And as we have already mentioned, each replicated chromosome consists of two sister chromatids that are joined together along their length, and each chromatid is constricted at a region of specialized DNA sequence, which is called the centromere. Right, in, this, in the center of the chromosome. So just before prometaphase, kinetochore proteins will assemble into a large complex on each centrosome, right? And those, the mitotic spindle is going to go and bind uh, on, on the, uh, or, or that my, my, mitotic microtubule is going to go and bind on the kinetochore. So once the nuclear envelope has disintegrated, a randomly probing microtubule encountering a kinetochore will bind, bind to it, thereby capturing the chromosome, right? And such a microtubule is called a kinetochore microtubule, right? Because it's a microtubule that is attached to the kinetochore and it links the chromosome to a spindle pole. Now, as I said before, not every microtubule emanating from the two centrosomes will end up forming a, either a kinetochore microtubule or a polar microtubule, right? In fact, several of the microtubules will remain unattached right? And they are called unattached microtubules, right? Now, during prometaphase, the chromosomes which are now attached to the mitotic spindle appear to move as if they are jerked around randomly in different directions, right? So if you look at them under a microscope, they're moving this way, that way. But finally, they will align along the equator between the two poles, right? So they align at the equator of the spindle, halfway between the two spindle poles, and thereby they form what is called the metaphase plate, right? These aligned chromosomes along the equator, they form what is called the metaphase plate. And the formation of the metaphase plate basically defines the beginning of the next phase of mitosis, which is called metaphase, right? Now, the precise forces that act to bring the chromosomes to the equator are not well understood. Again, this is like 15 years back. Maybe today they understand. Okay, I don't know whether they have since figured that out or not, right, or how important that is. However, the continual growth and shrinkage of the microtubules, right, and the action of microtubule motor proteins are thought to play a role, right? Because remember, these microtubules, there's continuous polymerization, depolymerization, right? So by doing that, you can probably, you know, move the, the chromosomes this way, that way, you know, but they finally line up. So in this context, we know that a continuous balanced addition and loss of tubulin subunits is required to maintain the mitotic spindle, all right? It is not a permanent structure. It's a temporary transient structure, right? That is maintained by the addition and loss of tubulin units. Thus, when tubulin addition is blocked in, in a mitotic cell using, say, the drug colchicin, right? Tubulin loss is going to continue until the spindle disappears, right? So in that case, if you have a cell that is trying to divide, it, doesn't, it cannot form the mitotic spindle. Guess what? The cell just cannot divide, right? This is used in some cancer treatments because you don't want the cancer cell to divide, right? So you can give the drug colchicin, right? To go ahead and knock out the mitotic spindle. The challenge here, of course, is you want the normal cells to divide, okay? How are you going to administer the drug so that it selectively targets only the cancer cells? Okay, that's a different challenge. Right? 
Any questions? So we have covered prophase, prometaphase, and metaphase, all right? So the next phase is the anaphase, all right? Where the two chromosomes are going to split apart, right, and go in two directions. So at the start of anaphase, the connections between the two sister chromatids are cut by proteolytic enzymes. Again, proteolytic enzymes are enzymes that disintegrate proteins, all right? Remember, we talked about nucleases, proteases, and so on, okay? So the connections are going to be cut, allowing each chromatid, now each chromatid is going to be called a daughter chromosome, to be gradually pulled to the spindle pole to which it is attached. Right? And this movement is the result of two independent processes brought about by different parts of the mitotic spindle. Right? And these processes are called anaphase A and anaphase B, and their occurrence is more or less simultaneous. So they are happening at the same time. Right? And what are those mechanisms? Right? See, like if you go back to that earlier picture, right? See, if this thing shorten, if this thing starts shortening, right? Okay, so two things can pull the chromosomes apart. Number one, if this thing starts shortening, right? It can pull it apart, right? The second thing is if the poles, they start moving away from each other, right? How can that happen? Well, if more units are added here and then these two things, they start sliding away from each other, that can also happen. So one of them is called anaphase A, the other one is called anaphase B, right? And that's what I will try to explain. So you have anaphase A and anaphase B. So in anaphase A, the kinetochore microtubules, that means the ones that are bound to the chromosomes, right, uh, shortened by depolymerization, and the two daughter chromosomes move towards their respective spindle poles. Right? In anaphase B, the spindle poles themselves move away from each other, further contributing to the segregation of the two groups of daughter chromosomes. Right? And the driving force for the movements of anaphase A is thought to be provided partly by the action of microtubule, motor, that means movement generating proteins, operating at the kinetochore end, right? And partly by the loss of tubulin units, subunits, that occurs mainly at the kinetochore end of the kinetochore microtubules, right? So that's how you get the movement in anaphase A. And the driving force for the moving, uh, part, uh, moving apart of the spindle poles in anaphase B is thought to be provided by the polymerization of the polar microtubules by the addition of tubulin units at their free ends. Right. That's what I showed you in the picture. So we have finished anaf uh, talking about anaphase. Next phase is telophase. The last step in mitosis is telophase. And during telophase, a nuclear envelope will reform around each group of chromosomes to form the two daughter nuclei. And the, with the creation of the two daughter nuclei, the process of nuclear division or mitosis is complete. Right. And the M phase involves more than just the segregation of the daughter chromosomes and the formation of new nuclei. It is also the time during which other components of the cell, such as membranes, organelles, okay, that means the compartments inside the cell and proteins are distributed more or less evenly between the two daughter cells. Right. So now you've had nuclear division. Instead of one nucleus, you now have two nuclei containing you know, the, the daughter chromosomes. You still need the cell to divide, right? The middle of the cell still has to pinch in and divide, right? And that's carried out by a contractile ring, right? So, so the division of the components of the cell is achieved by what is called cytokinesis and usually begins in anaphase but is not completed until after the two daughter nuclei have formed, right? And regarding cytokinesis, the actual division, right? of the cells of these di different compartments and all that, uh, we know the, make the following observations. First, the mitotic spindle determines the plane of cytoplasmic cleavage, right? which is usually orthogonal to the orientation of the mitotic spindle. So people have done experiments where, you know, like you have a dividing cell, right? Let's say you use a needle to move the mitotic spindle, you change the orientation. Then you find out that the, the plane along which the cell actually divides is perpendicular to the orientation of the mitotic spindle. Right? Then the, the second observation is that the contractile ring of animal cells is responsible for carrying out cy cytokinesis in such cells, and it is made up of the proteins actin and myosin, right? So again, it's the proteins. Remember, I said in the chapter on proteins, proteins are extremely versatile molecules, okay? They are the ones that carry out a lot of different things, right? DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, and so on, okay? 
Now, if you're looking at plant cells, the cytokinesis is a little bit more complicated because that involves the formation of a new cell wall, all right? Uh, presumably because the plant cells in general are surrounded by a tough cell wall, okay? And in fact, you know, the word cell originated from the cell wall because that's what Robert Hooke saw under a microscope when he looked at, at a piece of cork, right? The, the, these were dead cells, but the cell walls were left behind, and he called them, that's why he called them cells, okay? Okay, so that concludes our discussion of mitosis, all right? Any questions? So next we will move on to meiosis, right? Which is the mechanism by which the egg and the sperm, all right, or the gametes are produced from their diploid precursors, all right? So in this section, we take a look at my meiosis, which is another kind of eukaryotic cell division, which is employed by sexually reproducing diploid organisms. Diploid organism means two copies of each chromosome, right? To produce the reproductive cells. So in a diploid organism, all the cells of the body, including the germline cells that give rise to the gametes, are diploid, right? However, the gametes themselves are haploid, right? So the gametes, the egg and the sperm have only one copy of each chromosome, but even the cells, that give, the precursors that give rise to the egg and the sperm, they have two copies of each chromosome. Thus, the haploid gametes must be produced from their diploid precursors by a special type of cell division, right? And this special type of cell division is called meiosis. And we've seen a little bit of meiosis earlier in the chapter on genetic variation, but here we will take a more detailed look. Now, with the exception of the chromosomes that determine sex, that is the sex chromosomes, right? That, that's the X and Y chromosome, right? Two Xs in females and, and X and Y in male. A diploid nucleus contains two very similar versions of each chromosome, one from the father, called the paternal chromosome, and one from the mother, which is called the maternal chromosome. The two versions of each chromosome, however, are not genetically identical, right? and they carry different variants of many of the genes, right? And I gave you the reasons for that last time when we talked about genetic variation, right? We did the math, right? I mean, no two people are going to have exactly the same genes, right? So these uh, chromosomes, right, uh, which are similar, right, but uh, not completely identical, they are called homologous chromosomes or homologs, meaning that they are similar but not identical, right? So a diploid cell in a sexually reproducing organism consequently carries two similar sets of genetic information. Right. Now in most cells, the paternal and the maternal chromosomes, or homologues, they maintain a completely separate existence as independent chromosomes. In other words, let's say if you have chromosome number 10 from your dad and from your mom, okay, they stay completely separate inside a cell, so you wouldn't know. Okay, It's not like they, uh, you know, aggregate together or anything like that, right? They exist independently. Now, mitosis and meiosis are similar in certain respects, but there are important differences that we will be discussing, right? And again, I think the best way to do that is to look at the figure, right? And, th and then we'll go through the text, all right? So let's look at this figure. So first, if you look at my uh, mitotic cell division, right? That's on the right, right? So in, in mitotic cell division, again, if you're looking at a human cell, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, all right? I'm going to focus attention only on one pair of cr chromosomes, all right? You have the maternal homologue, the paternal homologue, all right? So you want this cell to divide, so you're going to have to replicate the DNA. So the, the homologous chromosomes, the, let's say the maternal chromosome homologue is in, in red, the paternal one is black, right? Both of them replicate, right? And then after that, uh, one copy of, of each maternal chromosome, right, must go to, go to one cell, right, and one copy of each paternal chromosome must go to one cell, right. So there's no lining up. They do, these two chromosomes, they will still behave like, uh, they are, you know, they kind of, kind of don't even know each other, that they have so much of similarity, right. But then you will have the division that will take place, right. So, the, so, the, so, so once the replication has taken place, all right, then these things will line up, okay. Remember, there's a metaphase plate. Okay, there will be the poles, all right, along the equator, the chromosomes will line up, right? So they will line up like this, right? So the paternal chromosome, the maternal chromosome, and these, these are the poles that you have, right? And then when the division actually takes place, right, the, uh, for, for these black chromosomes, all right, one copy will go to the cell on the left, one, one to the cell on the right, right? So, so you have a black, black chromosome in the, in, in, the, in the daughter cell on the left, black one in the daughter cell on the right, red one on the left, red one on the right, right? 
So the generic information that is transmitted is identical. Right? I mean, modular DNA replication errors. Okay? If no mistakes were made during DNA replication, exactly whatever information you had in the parent cell, right, that is replicated and then pro properly partitioned between the two daughter cells. Right? That's what is involved in mitosis. And, and of course, all these things, they involve all those different steps that we talked about. Okay? Prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. All that stuff is there. Right? But at the end of the day, the original genetic information is basically passed on to the progeny, right? Hopefully unaltered, completely unaltered. Right? That is mitosis. In meiosis, things are a little bit different, right? Because you have to, you cannot end up with a deployed egg or a deployed uh, sperm, right? You have to end up with cells that are haploid, okay? So, so in, in the case of meiosis, see, in theory, okay, what could have happened is, because you just want to halve the number of chromosomes, right? This, this, this guy, okay, without DNA replication, they, you could, this one could just split in two, right? Then you would have one cell that would carry the maternal chromosome, the other cell would carry the paternal chromosome, right? And, and things would have been a lot simpler, right? But for some unknown reason, that doesn't happen. DNA replication does take place, right? So the paternal chromosome replicates, the maternal chromosome also repl replicates. So, oh, here I marked the mat maternal one in black, you know, but again, it's no big deal, right? So one is uh, the maternal one, the other one is the paternal one. Both of them replicate. But the homologous chromosomes, they will line up next to each other on the metaphase plate. Right? Before any division takes place, these guys line up next to each other. Right? So if they line up next to each other, right, what is going to happen? These are homologous chromosomes, so there's going to be some recombination. Right? Some DNA is going to be exchanged between the, metal, between, between the replicated maternal chromosome and the replicated paternal chromosome. So genetic variation is going to be introduced. So this is not new. We already discussed that right earlier. Then, after that, you're going to have two rounds of cell splitting, right? Because you replicated the DNA. So one round of cell splitting is not going to be enough to give you a haploid gamete, right? So you'll have two rounds of cell splitting, right, to give you the haploid gametes, right? So you have these four different gametes now, right? So this is how meiosis occurs, okay? Now, you have to be careful, all right, because the process can get messed up. Like here, we are assuming that after two rounds of cell division, okay, you are going to have one chromosome in each one, each one of these gametes, all right? What happens if things didn't, didn't separate out properly and let's say this one had nothing and then this guy had two copies of that chromosome, all right? That's a problem because then you will have an egg or a sperm that has an extra copy of a chromosome, right? And uh, we, we will see what that leads to. But just keep that in mind. Okay. So mistakes can be made during this uh, uh, procedure of meiosis, all right? And, and, and that could cause problems in, in the progeny. So when, so let's see, I mean, I think I probably have to go back, All right? So in, in my, mitosis, each, each chromosome, right? So, so again, I mean, that picture showed you only one pair of chromosomes, that is happening for 23 pairs, right? Just keep that in mind. So in mitosis, each chromosome replicates and the replicated chromosomes line up in random order at the metaphase plate. The two sister chromatids then separate from each other to become individual chromosomes, and the two daughter cells produced by cytokinesis inherit a copy of each paternal chromosome and a copy of each maternal chromosome. That's exactly what I showed you on the, in the picture, right? Thus, both sets of genetic information are transmitted intact to the two daughter cells, which are therefore each deployed, right? They have two copies of each chromosome, and they are genetically identical, right? Modulo, of course, mistakes that are made in, in DNA replication. So in contrast, when diploid cells divide by meiosis, they form haploid gametes with only one half the original number of chromosomes, right? That is only one chromosome of each type instead of a pair of homologs of each type, right? Thus, each gamete is going to acquire either the maternal copy or the paternal copy of a chromosome, but not both, right? So this reduction is needed so that when two gametes of opposite types, an egg and a f sperm fuse, right? at fertilization, 
the chromosome number is restored in the embryo to the original diploid number for that species. Right? So like if you're, if you're looking at a human species, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Right? So, you, so the, the fertilized egg should have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So if you have like not 23 pairs, like a cell containing 23 chromosomes or a fusel with another cell containing 23 chromosomes, then you will have 23 pairs, which is what you need. Right. Now, since the assignment of maternal and paternal chromosomes to the gametes during meiosis occurs at random, the original maternal and paternal chromosomes are reshuffled into an incredibly large number of different co combinations, okay? which is something that we discussed earlier in the chap chapter on genetic variation. Right? We looked at the large number of uh, possible combinations. So as noted in that chapter and as shown in the figure, in a meiotic cell division, the replicated homologous paternal and maternal chromosomes, including the two replicated sex chromosomes, they pair up alongside each other before they line up on the spindle. Right. This makes it possible for crossovers by homologous recombination to occur at this stage. And in principle, as I said before, since meiosis involves halving of the number of chromosomes, it could have occurred by a simple modification of a normal mitotic cell division such that the DNA replication, S phase, is omitted. Right. For unknown reasons, the actual meiotic process is more complicated and involves DNA replication followed by two cell divisions right, instead of one, as shown in the, in the figure, as I demonstrated to you in the figure. Right. Now, occasionally, this meiotic process occurs abnormally. Right. Like when you have those two cell divisions, which I pointed out, you know, one cell might have two copies, the other cell might have nothing. Right. And the homologs might fail to separate. And this is a phenomenon which is called non-disjunction. Right. In this case, some of the gametes that are produced lack a particular chromosome, while others have more than one copy of it. Right. Such gametes, when combined with a normal gamete of the opposite type, they will form abnormal embryos, right. most of which do not survive. Most of those embryos will, are going to be eliminated in utero. Right. In the womb, it's gone. Okay. Some, however, do, and Down, I mean, all of you may have seen people with Down syndrome, right? So they have an extra copy of chromosome 21, right? Because, I, I mean, either the egg or the sperm, in their case, right, had an extra copy of this chromosome. So when the fusion took place, there are three copies now, right, instead of two copies, right? And this condition is therefore referred to in the scientific literature as trisomy 21, meaning that such a person's genome has got three copy, copies of chromosome 21 instead of the two copies that normal humans have. Okay. Okay, now before I go to the next chapter, right, are there any questions? And there are other diseases too, okay, I mean like, for example, you know, if you have X and Y, okay, that's supposed to be a male, right, one X chromosome, one Y chromosome, that's a male. Two X's is a female, okay. Suppose you have somebody that has, let's say, two X's and a Y, right, that person will have both male and female characteristics. Right? And it happens rarely, but there are people like that. Right? Or three X's, that's a triple X. Right? I'm not going into the details of that. You know, if you're interested, you can you know, look at a book on genetics. They will talk about all the different kind of characteristics that people with uh, you know, defective uh, number of chromosomes, right? abnormal number of chromosomes, uh, the, the different traits that they will display. You know? But it, uh, it's quite interesting, like many, many, many uh, diseases that have a genetic component, you know, they could be caused by uh, abnormality in the number of chromosomes. Uh, now, before I go on to the next chapter, are, are there any questions? I wanted to point out one more thing, all right? See, if you're looking at meiosis, all right? So from the, uh, so in meiosis, basically, is this, the cells in the ovaries, they are, uh, they are uh, diploid cells, okay? They have two copies of each chromosome, okay? So they have to produce the egg, all right, which has only one copy, all right? So what, what happens, all right, is that, so you are going to have uh, the DNA replication, all right? Then uh, you have all this business of lining up and all that stuff. And then <clears throat> you have two rounds of cell division, okay? So this is meiosis one, okay? The first round of cell division, all right? This is meiosis one, and then the second round is, is meiosis two, okay? Now it turns out that in in uh, in females, okay, uh, the this meiotic division is basically arrested at this stage, right? So even before a female is born, okay, the total number of of eggs that that female is going to produce in their lifetime is predetermined, okay? That is determined even before birth, all right? And it is arrested here, right? 
it is arrested here and then you know after puberty that's when this rest of it takes place okay so just keep, and i need that information because you know if you're taking a frog egg right the frog egg is a convenient system because it is arrested all right so dna has replicated but the, the cell division has been arrested just before meiosis 1 right so for doing some of the tests in the lab you can use the frog egg it's convenient because if you give some component and it moves to the next stage then you know that that component is the one that was needed to move from a particular stage in cell division to the next one right so that's the reason why i'm pointing this out but also it is a fact as i said so so that's why i mean like you know there are some things that are predetermined before birth right the ex exact number of eggs that will be produced that the female will produce during their lifetime is predetermined and and these things even before birth they are arrested right here right and then the next step is like one egg at a time you know once puberty is attained All right, any questions? So mitosis is for the... Uh... Mitosis is the, for the normal cells in the body, okay, somatic cells. Meiosis is, is, is the procedure by which the diploid precursors, right, let's say of the egg, which is from the cells in the ovary, right, will produce the egg, right, or cells in the testes will produce the sperm, right. That is meiosis, yeah. But this one is going to be needed. That's, that's why I'm pointing it out right now, because in the next chapter I will need it to show the experiments that are needed to understand, you know, what are the factors that drive, uh, that control the cell cycle, all right? Drive the cell from one particular stage in the cell cycle to the next. Because as I said before, the, in this chapter, we focused only on the partitioning of the contents, all right? The timing, all right? Or how the whole procedure is controlled, right? That is important. That is going to be taken up in the next, next chapter. And, you know, this is very, very important because if you think about it, you know, like a single fertilized egg in nine months is going to grow into a full-blown organism in the womb, right? So cell division has to be controlled very tightly, right? So it is like, so it's like a cancer. I mean, like the development of a child is like a cancer, but it's controlled. All the right controls are in place, right? Where cell division is needed, that's where it's occurring, right? In an adult, you don't need so much of cell division, right? If you get too much of cell division, then you can probably get cancer, right? So, the, so the, this fact I will need to use that f for the egg, it is basically arrested just prior to this stage, right? Right? Okay, any questions? So in the next chapter, right, we'll talk about cell cycle control, right? Cell death and also cancer, right? And just get started with cancer and then there's a chapter that is devoted to cancer. I will cover that. Right, because I'm making good progress, you guys are keeping up pace, so it's fine, you know, I will cover that, although the cancer is not very much relevant to plant genomics, okay. And so once I finish that cell cycle control, uh, cell death or cancer, then the chapter on cancer, that's after the exam, then I will talk about what are called microarrays, all right. Then we'll probably have maybe two or three weeks of discuss discussion of only of the engineering topics, okay. What kind of data you can get from the cells and what you can do with that data before I go to, to plant genomics. Okay, so in this chapter, we, we introduce the phenomena of cell cycle control and something that is called programmed cell death in multicellular organisms and discuss how disruption in either of these can lead to the disease called cancer, right? So the cell division is under very tight control, right? And if, if cells become old, right, or in response to certain conditions, you know, uh, the cells will commit a, uh, they will commit some kind of, uh, they have a, uh, some kind of cell death mechanism, which is like suicidal, right? They'll go and kill themselves for the benefit of the organism, right? Right? So that, that cell death is called apoptosis, which we will discuss in the next chapter, right? But here, let's talk about the cell cycle control. So our discussion so far has focused on two aspects of cell division. Number one, replication of the contents of the cell. Number two, the actual partitioning of these replicated contents between the two daughter cells when the cell divides, right? So there is yet another aspect of cell division, which is crucially important, namely the mechanism by which the cell controls the dif different chronological steps that are involved in cell division, okay? So how, what is the timing mechanism, okay, for things to run smoothly? All right, that's what we are going to look at in this chapter. And that is carried out by enzymes uh, that are called kinases, okay? Anybody remember what are kinases? Add a phosphate group, yeah. Kinases add phosphates, uh, phosphatases remove phosphates, okay? And this is very, very important in eukaryotic cell division because 
the control of the cell, of, the, of cell division is carried out by the activity of different kinases, right? Which we will discuss in this chapter. Now, the events of the cell cycle occur in a fixed sequence. Namely, you're going to have M phase, right? M phase is when you have mitosis, right? And so, uh, so uh, nuclear division, right? And separation of the, of the contents, right? So that M phase is followed by G1 phase, right? Remember, G1 was gap 1. That picture that I showed, M, G1, S was the DNA replication phase, DNA synthesis phase, then G2. So M, G1, S, G2. Uh, M, G1, S, G2. This continues, okay? So, so the events of the cell cycle occur in a fixed sequence, namely M phase followed by the G1 phase, G1 phase followed by S phase, S phase followed by G2 phase, right? Think of that, of that, of that circle, right? And finally, G2 phase followed by M phase again, right? Now, this is ensured by a cell cycle control system, right? So you cannot get away from controls. Even here, you have a control system, right, which has to perform a number of functions, right? First of all, it has to activate the enzymes and other proteins that are responsible for carrying out each process in the cell cycle at the appropriate time. And then it has to deactivate them once the process is completed, right? It must also ensure that each stage of the cell cycle is completed before the next one is begun, right? For example, it has to make sure that the DNA replication has been completed before mitosis begins, right? That mitosis has been completed before cytokinesis begins, right? Cytokinesis is, again, the splitting of the cell in two. Mitosis is the nuclear division. So it has to make sure that the step before it has been completed before it moves on to the next step, right? So there has to be some kind of timing, a timing diagram, right? Some kind of timing that take, takes place. And it also has to take in those additional factors, right? so that it doesn't prematurely jump into the next step. The control system must also take into account if the conditions outside the cell are conducive for division, right? If you don't have enough nutrients, okay, the food supply is short, you don't want to create more cells, okay, that will need more food, okay, because then they will die, right? So the condition, conditions have to be conducive. For example, in a multicellular organism, the control system must be responsive to signals from other cells such as those that stimulate cell division when more cells are needed, right? So if you have a cut or a wound, right, there are blood platelets that are released over there, right? They will stimulate the surviving cells to divide, right? So they release something called a platelet-derived growth factor that will stimulate the surviving cells to divide, okay? So the cells have to be responsive to that, okay? So it is clear that the cell cycle control system plays a major role in the regulation of cell numbers in the tissues of the body. And when the system malfunctions, then you can, it, it can result in the disease that is called cancer, right? So cancer is an umbrella term really for, you know, a host of diseases that can result when this control system is messed up, right? Just like, you know, uh, many of you have background in controls. In controls, you talk about stability, okay? Stability, if you're looking at a linear system, can happen only in one way. All the poles or all the eigenvalues have to be in the left half plane. But if you're looking at instability, it can happen in many different ways. You can have one pole in the right half plane, right? Two poles in the right half plane and so on, okay? There is an infinite, well, I mean, if it's pole, I guess it's, it's finite, but you know, there is a large number of possibilities. Same way in cancer, it's a large number of possibilities, all right? The control system is messed up, right? It can be messed up in many different ways. But if you have, if you consider the example of a child developing in a womb, it's happening only in one way. In most cases, you have, you know, five fingers, five toes and so on, okay? You don't have six, all right? Unless something, something got messed up, right? then the fingers are also sculpted properly and, and so on, right? So that's under very, very, very tight control. So the operation of the cell cycle control system is very similar to that of the control system for any uh, cyclic process. We will illustrate this by drawing the analogy with an automatic washing machine, right? So if you look at the duty cycle of an automatic washing machine, it consists of the following five steps. Number one, take in water, Mix with detergent. Number three, wash the clothes. Rinse them, number four. And number five, spin them dry, right? So in the eukaryotic cell cycle, these steps are analogous to, let's say, DNA replication, or right, mitosis and so on, right? So things have to take place in a, in, a, in a particular order, right? Furthermore, the washing machine controller is itself regulated at certain critical points of the cycle by feedback from the processes that are being performed, right? If the water level is not right, it will probably not go and go on to move on to the washing cycle, right? So 
water uh, sensors monitor the water level in the washing machine and send signals back to the controller to prevent the start of the next process before the current one has been completed. Similarly, in the case of uh, uh, the cell cycle, the ev events of the cell cycle have to occur in a particular sequence. And this sequence must be preserved even if one of the steps is taking longer than usual. For example, all of the nuclear DNA must be replicated right, before the nucleus starts to divide, right, before you actually have mitosis. Right? And it is crucial for most cells to double in size before dividing in two, as otherwise the cells would get progressively smaller at each cell division. Right? The cell cycle control system achieves all this by means of molecular breaks that can stop the cycle at various checkpoints. Right. So it is going to check, is the, has the previous step been done? If not, let's wait, right. that kind of thing. The control system in most cells has checkpoints for cell size, where the cell cycle is halted until the cell has grown to an appropriate size. For example, in G1, G1 is the gap one phase again. So a size checkpoint allows the system to halt and the cell to grow further if necessary before a new round of DNA replication is triggered. Because the next phase after the G1 phase is the S phase or the DNA synthesis phase. Okay, so before you do any DNA synthesis, make sure that the cell has grown large enough, right? Whatever growth needed to be achieved during G1 phase has been achieved, right? Now, cell growth depends on an adequate supply of nutrients and other factors in the extracellular environment. And the G1 checkpoint also allows the cell to check that the environment is favorable for cell proliferation before committing itself to the DNA replication or S phase, right? You have to make sure that things are favorable. There, is enough uh, there are enough nutrients in the environment and so on, okay? Then there is a second size check. And again, as I said before, knowing all these terms is important, right? Not for this class, but if you're going to do interdisciplinary work, you need to know this term because the biologists will refer to as G1 arrest, okay? What does that mean? That means the cell cycle stopped in the G1 phase, right? For some reason, let's say, you zap a cell with a lot of radiation, right? The DNA has been damaged, okay? The damaged DNA should not be replicated, right? That means the cell has to stop in that, G, in that G1 phase, right? Before it goes to DNA replication, take, uh, remove, take out the damaged DNA, repair it, and then only do the DNA replication, right? So they will refer to that as G1 arrest that is induced by radiation, right? Then there is a second size checkpoint which occurs in G2, right? So you could have G2 arrest too, allowing the system to halt uh, before it uh, triggers mitosis, right? And the G2 checkpoint also allows the cell to check that DNA replication is complete before proceeding to mitosis. You have to make sure that the DNA replication has been completed before you go ahead and, and carry out nuclear division. Now, how does the cell cycle control system function, right? The cell cycle control system governs the cell cycle machinery through the phosphorylation of key proteins, okay? Adding, key, adding phosphate groups to key proteins, okay? When you add a phosphate group, that has got two negative charges, all right? That is going to alter the conformation of the protein, right? It, it is going to go from active to inactive and so on, okay? So the cell cycle machinery con uh, carries out the control through the phosphorylation of key proteins that initiate or regulate DNA replication mitosis and cytokinesis, okay? All the different steps of the cell cycle, they are controlled by these guys, all right? Now, recall that the phosphorylation reactions are carried out by enzymes that are called kinases, all right? So we introduce kinases for a reason, okay? Not just for the fun of it, especially since, you know, for the kinases, you cannot get uh, any idea about its function. Like you have hydrolases, you have proteases and all, nucleases, you can, just from the, for, from the name, you can say what, what its function is going to be, all right? For the kinase, it's going to add uh, a phosphate group. So the protein kinases of the cell cycle control system are present in dividing cells throughout the cell cycle, right? But they are not active. So they are activated, however, only at appropriate times in the cycle, after which they quickly become deactivated again. And this is made possible by a second set of protein components of the control system, which are called cyclins, right? Cyclins have got no enzymatic activity by themselves. So they don't carry out any reactions or right? they're not catalysts, all right? So they, they are the ones that actually do the timing, right? Because their concentration varies cyclically with time, right? So cyclins have no enzymatic activity by themselves, but they have to bind to the cell cycle kinases before the kinases can become enzymatically active. As a result, the kinases of the cell cycle control system, 
They are referred to as cyclin-dependent ki protein kinases, all right, or CDKs for short. Any questions? Now, cyclins derive their name from the fact that their concentrations vary in a cyclical fas fashion during the cell cycle. Right. Uh, here we'll focus on only one cyclin CDK complex, right? Because the, see, there are different phases in 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 the in the in the cell cycle, right? So there will be different cy cyclins and cyclin dependent kinases that will drive the cell into into different stages. We are going to focus only on one of them. The others are similar, right? So we will focus on the cyclin CDK or cyclin dependent kinase complex, which is responsible for driving cells into mitosis, right? So basically into M phase, right? So this cyclin, cyclin-dependent kinase complex, is known as the M phase promoting factor because it, it can drive cells. Uh, you know, if, if there is a cell that has been halted just before M phase, you give it this factor, the cell will move into M phase. Right. So the cyclin CDK complex that drives cells into M phase was first discovered through studies of cell division in frog eggs. Okay, again, remember I said before, for the frog egg, it, it has completed DNA replication. It is arrested just before the M phase of the first meiotic cell division. Right. So if I add this factor, it will push it over there. Then I know that this is the factor that can basically bring, up, uh, bring about the transition to M phase. Now the fertilized eggs of many animals are especially well suited for biochemical studies of the cell cycle because number one, they are very large cells, right? Because if you take a frog's egg, it's about one millimeter in diameter. Right? That's pretty large for a cell, okay? Because you, for a cell, you're looking at micrometers, right? In size. Frog's egg is about a millimeter in diameter. And they also divide very rapidly. Why? Because, as I said before, the first few divisions right, of a fertilized egg, there are cleavage cell divisions where, where there's no G1, G2. So it happens very fast. Okay? Replicate DNA divide, replicate DNA divide, and so on. Right? So by taking frog eggs at a particular stage of the cell cycle, right, an extract can be prepared which is representative of that cell cycle stage. Right? You basically you know, grind that thing up and you, then you, you know, collect all, all, the, all the stuff that you get. Right? So you have the extract. So that will have the enzymes that are characteristic of that particular stage. Now the biological activity of such an extract can then be tested by injecting it into a Xenopus oocyte. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not the frog egg. It's the oocyte that is the one that I'm talking about that is arrested before the uh, first meiotic cell division, right? So the biological activity of such an ex extract, so you can take an extract from different stages of the, of the cell cycle, right? Like if you, if you want to, uh, to see what enzymes are present, let's say in, in S phase or something, you can create an extract with that, okay? But to test the activity, you are going to use what is called a Xenopus oocyte, which is the immature diploid precursor of the unfertilized frog egg. Right? So it still hasn't become a frog egg. Right? It's, the, it, it's still a diploid. So the, the DNA replication has also taken place, right? but it is arrested just before uh, the first meiotic division. Right? So the biological activity of such an extract can then be tested by injecting it into a Xenopus oocyte, which is the immature diploid precursor of the unfertilized frog egg, and observing its effect, effects on cell cycle behavior. The Xenopus oocyte is a convenient test system for detecting an activity that will drive cells into M phase, right? As it has completed DNA replication, which is what I pointed out in an earlier picture, and it is arrested just before the M phase of the first meiotic division, right? So the oocyte is therefore at a stage in the cell cycle that is equivalent to the G2 phase of a mitotic cell cycle. Right? Nature has already done that. The DNA replication has taken place, right? Uh, and uh, you have basically the stuff arrested just before the M phase of the first meiotic division, right? So what is needed to drive that into, into the f first meiotic division, right? I, I can check, you know, what factor is going to force it, in, 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 what factor is going to make it cross over into uh, in the first, uh, first meiotic division, right? Is that clear to everybody? Uh, with reference to that picture that I showed you about meiosis, I was telling you that in the case of females, the, 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 before the egg is formed, you know, the thing is arrested. Just after DNA replication, even before, before birth, okay, it is arrested 
just prior to the first meiotic division, right? So you can use this as a test system, right? Take the extract and then put it in there and see if it crosses over, right? So in such experiments, it was found that an abstract from an M-phase fertilized egg, right, instantly drives the oocyte into M-phase, whereas cytoplasm from a cleaving egg at other phases of the cycle does not, right? So when initially discovered the chemical composition and the mechanism of action of the factor that is responsible for this activity were unknown, and consequently the factor was simply called the M-phase promoting factor or MPF. So MPF activity was found to oscillate dramatically during the course of each cell cycle, as shown in the, in the following figure, right? You can see this is the MPF activity, or right? it increases gradually, right? I'm sorry, it increases rapidly before the onset of the M phase, and then it, it declines also very rapidly. Then again, before the next M phase, it will go up rapidly, again decline very rapidly, and so on, okay? So, M, so the M phase promoting factor activity was found to oscillate dramatically during the course of each cell cycle, as I showed you in that figure. It increased rapidly just before the start of mitosis and fell rapidly to zero towards the end of mitosis. So subsequent studies revealed that, that this uh, M phase promoting factor, it contains a single protein kinase, which is required for its activity. Right. So, by phos so it's a kinase, so it's going to phosphorylate some key proteins, okay? So by phosphorylating key proteins, the kinase causes several phenomena associated with mitosis to occur. Like if you're going to have mitosis, you need the condensation of the chromosomes. You need the disintegration of the nuclear envelope, all right? And you need the formation of the mitotic spindle, right? So this uh, kinase is able to make all these things occur by phosphorylating some of the key proteins, all right? However, the MPF kinase, right, M phase promoting factor kinase, is not capable of acting by itself, and it has to have a specific cyclin bound to it in order to function, right? And biochemical experiments using cleaving clam eggs, right? Again, clam eggs that are, you know, splitting up, right? Uh, that means um, they are undergoing the cleavage divisions, okay? So biochemical experiments using cleaving clam eggs led to the discovery of cyclin. Cyclin was initially identified as a protein. Again, it's called cyclin because its concentration varies in a cyclical fashion, right? So it was initially identified as a protein whose concentration rose gradually during interphase and then fell rapidly to zero as the cells went through M phase, repeating this performance in each cell cycle, right? So if you look at this picture right here, all right, the red one is the cyclin concentration. You can see that that rises gradually, then it falls gradually, rises gradually, falls gradually. The other one, rises, uh, it, it rises rapidly, right? But, but it, and then it falls also very rapidly, okay? So, the, I mean, the two are not similar, especially during this stage, okay? When, uh, the, when the concentration is going up, cycling concentration goes up gradually, but the MPF factor, the acti activity of MPF goes up very, very, very quickly, okay? So there is some more explanation that is needed. You cannot just say that only because... Of, so this does not exactly follow... The MPF activity does not exactly follow the activity pattern of cycling. Okay? Or the, con the con concentration... Of, it does not exactly track the, the uh, you know, variation of concentration of cycling. So cycling concentration goes up uh, gradually, but it falls very sharply, right? Uh, the MPF activity goes up very quickly, rapidly, and it also falls very rapidly, right? So you'll need some ex explanation. So the MPF is a protein complex that contains two subunits, a regulatory subunit, that is a cyclin, and a catalytic subunit, that is a mitotic, cyclin-dependent kinase. So many of these cell cycle control genes have been remarkably conserved during biological evolution, in fact, the human version of these genes will function perfectly well when it is introduced into a yeast cell, right? That's quite remarkable, right? The manufacture of the cyclin component of uh, the M phase promoting factor starts immediately after cell division and continues steadily through interphase. The cyclin will accumulate, it will build up, or concentration will build up, so that it, 
And then when the concentration crosses a particular threshold, it times the onset of mitosis, right? Its subsequent rapid decrease helps initiate the exit from mitosis, right? And the sudden fall in the cycling concentration during mitosis is the result of rapid de degradation of the cyclin by the ubiquitin-dependent proteolytic system. Anybody remember what that was? What was ubiquitin? No, not indicated. It's a protein that is used to mark out uh, other proteins that have to be basically kind of trashed, okay? Put into proteasomes and trashed and recycled. So the MPF activation initiates a process, right, which after some time delay leads to the ubiquination and degradation of the cyclin, thereby turning the kinase off. Because you don't want it to be permanently on because then the cell is permanently going to be doing the activities associated with M phase, right? So it needs to turn off. Now, from that figure that I showed you, we observed that the cyclin concentration increases gradually throughout interphase, whereas the MPF kinase activity switches on abruptly at the end of in interphase, right? So the cy uh, cyclic uh, variations in the, in the cyclin concentration alone cannot completely explain the MPF kinase activity, right? This is due to the fact that the kinase itself also has to be phosphorylated at one or more sites. It itself has to be activated, okay, through kin kinases and phosphat uh, phosphatases. So the rem removal of the, in so it has to be phosphorylated at one or more sites and dephosphorylated at some others before it can become enzymatically active, right? And the removal of the inhibitory phosphate groups by a specific protein phosphatase is the step that activates the kinase, the cyclin dependent kinase at the end of interface, right? And once activated, a cyclin CDK complex, you know, there's a positive feedback kind of mechanism, right? It can activate more cyclin CDK complexes by a positive feedback kind of me mechanism. And this positive feedback is what causes the sudden explosive increase in uh, MPF kinase activity, which will drive the cell abruptly into M phase. Yeah, let's stop here for, for today, right? And we'll continue after the exam.